Good morning, and you're very welcome to this morning's webinar. My name is Mark Gibson, and I'm Program Manager of the Chagas Connected Program. I trust you're all keeping well on this fine morning. This is the sixth in our series of Chagas Connected Signpost webinars, which take place and take a closer look at the science, policy, and advice around farm sustainability in Ireland. We do hope that you're enjoying our webinar series and that you find it useful during the current lockdown. Uh, the series is being delivered in association with the National Rural Network, Dairy Sustainability Ireland, and Food Drink Ireland Skillnet. We do want this session to be as interactive as possible, so you'll see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A tab, and I encourage you to make the most of this function. Uh, simply type in your question and hit submit, and we'll endeavor to put your questions to uh, our speaker today. Also, just to note that uh, today's session is being recorded and will be available uh, to view afterwards on the Chagas YouTube channel, along with all of our previous webinars. So in 2005, Ireland introduced the nitrates regulations into law. Uh, while the initial implementation was controversial, we are now into its 15th year of ex existence. Uh, as part of the regulations, regular reviews must be carried out on the effectiveness of the regulations. So today, I'm joined by Jack Nolan, Senior Inspector with the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, who is going to give us some context to the review process and some insights into what lies ahead. Jack, you're very welcome. So we'll just unmute you there, Jack. And Jack, can you hear me okay there? Yeah, good morning, Mark. I can hear you perfectly. Right, and we're also joined by uh, Pat Murphy, who is head of the Chagas Environment Knowledge Transfer Programme. Pat, good morning to you. Good morning. So you're both joining us from Wexford this morning. So I uh, hope the weather is fine. Sunny southeast. Sunny southeast. Great. So, um, so Jack, without further ado, I'm going to ask you to, uh, if you could fire up your presentation there. And uh, really looking forward to your presentation. And we'll do some questions and answers at the end of the session. So if anyone has questions for Jack, uh, if they want to submit them uh, during the presentation, uh, we will endeavor to, to answer as many of those questions as possible. Okay, thanks Mark. Good morning everybody. Um, I have a short presentation that's going to take maybe 25 minutes. Um, is that okay Mark? That looks good, yes. Okay, good morning, we'll start. So the first thing, what a derogation is, so the nitrates directive was brought in in 1991 and the reason it was brought in is because agriculture had intensified across Europe and there was increasing pressure on water quality. And it was felt that livestock intensification and uh, increasing use of chemical fertilizer were having a serious impact on water and it needed to be controlled better and used more efficiently. So Ireland signed up to the directive in 91, and as you said, we brought in the regulations in 2005. There's a general stocking rate limit in the regulation of 170 kilos per hectare of nitrogen from livestock. And if in Ireland, we think of it as two dairy cows. So each dairy cow at the moment, and since the regulation came in, has an equivalent uh, nitrogen excretion rate of 85 kilos. So that's the general limit. And then if you want to farm above that, and Ireland had to make a case to Europe, and it's made on an ongoing basis every four years, that because of our high, high net rainfall, um, our long growing season with our grass, and our high denitrification potential in the soils, that we can apply more nitrogen. And what we've seen over the last number of years, when it was applied for first in 2005, 2006, it was expected that it would be about 10,000. Uh, we've never had more than 7,000. This year we've had a fall of about 3% down to around 6,700, 6,800. But what we have seen are that a number of farmers are farming over 170 without a derogation, 11,500 in total. And this makes up a third of the bovine herd in Ireland. So we have an issue here that intensification is taking place and that not all these farmers are um, partaking in the derogation, they're exporting slurry to become compliant with the 170 limit. So just what's happened over the last number of years, not just in Ireland, but across the world, is that the number of extreme weather events have been increasing year on year. In 2018, we had the drought. Um, a couple of years ago, we had a fodder crisis. Like in the last seven years, I'd say we've had three fodder crises. So there's irrefutable evidence there that climate weather is changing and it's having a significant impact on agriculture. Agriculture has to adapt, agriculture has to make changes. So what I'm going to do during this presentation is talk about the impact that we're having, 
and then possible suggestions about how we're going to go about dealing with it. And you've seen, uh, this is a slide from the EU Commission from the Joint Research Centre, who say that by 2030 we'll have intensified further. And we see that, I'll put up a map in a few minutes, that'll show that the south, southwest of the country have intensified. Like since 2015, 2015 and the abolition of milk quota, there has been a significant increase in dairy numbers, but it's not taken place equally across the country. About a third of the increase has taken place in Tip and Cork alone. There are more dairy cows at the minute in Cork than there are in the six counties in Northern Ireland. And this has to have an impact on the environment. If you keep pouring in fertilizer, which is what slurry or dung or farmyard manure is, and using chemical fertilizer, there is a limit. Now, Chagas research shows that we can apply up to 250 kilos per hectare of livestock manure plus the required chemical. But unfortunately, some farmers must not be complying with the regulations and with the limits. And it's important to not blanket blame all farmers or say agriculture is responsible for this. There's a small cohort, cohort within agriculture that need to improve dramatically. And that would have a significant effect on water quality in Ireland. But when we go back to negotiate the derogation next year, we've already started a review in Ireland. It's this kind of information that the commission will be using. Look, you have expanded over the last number of years. It's predicted that you're going to expand further. What impact is that having on water quality? The policy guide in Ireland, or policy guides are, in 2015 and 2012, the UN um, established the Sustainable Development Goals, which is a blueprint for a better earth for everybody by 2030. And they were adopted by every member state of the UN in 2015. And the Department of Agriculture are lead on a number of these goals. So these are shaping government policy in Ireland. So you can see things like no poverty, zero hunger, um, life below water and so on, life on land. And agriculture in Ireland makes up two thirds of the land area. So obviously anything that's done on a farm is going to have an effect on the environment. And that is good and also bad. We must, must acknowledge all the good things that farmers have done. If you look around the habitat and the landscape of Ireland, parts of it are beautiful. Like you said earlier on, myself and Patrick in Wexford, I live beside the sea here. There are beautiful areas of forestry, hedgerows and so on, habitat areas. And then unfortunately, there are some hedgerows that are completely destroyed, or the value of them has been significantly reduced by people going too hard with a hedge cutter. There should be a little bit of room on every farm for at least a couple of white thorn skiocks to grow, for hedgerows maybe to be trimmed every couple of years, and all that will feed in to making a better environment. On the bottom on the right, you see the six uh, main messages from the EPA State of the Environment Report. And every four years, the EPA published this report, and it's really a scorecard on the Irish environment. And you can see there, and the next one is due this year, later on this year. And you can see there the six main points, so seven, sorry, environment, health and well-being, climate change, how we implement our legislation. So very good legislation in Ireland. For example, in the nitrates regulations, we deal with nitrogen and phosphorus. And we're one of only about five member states to do that. Like most member states don't deal with phosphorus. Sustainable economic activities, community engagement, nature and wild places, and restoring and protecting water quality. And you can see that agriculture is involved in every single one of those. And if we start with the very first one there, environment and health and well-being. Farmers, generally speaking, have very poor health. We're all very aware of safety on farms and that it's, you're about six times more likely to be killed in a farm accident, six or seven times, than in other, any other industry in Ireland. But you're also about five times more likely to get cancer and about three times more likely to get heart disease. And this needs to change because if we're not looking after ourselves as farmers, as an industry, well then the environment, it's just not going to feature at all. So that's the very first thing that needs to be solved is farmers' health. The department along with Carlo IT and the HSE is developing a program that will be rolled out for agricultural advisors to help them when they're meeting with farmers deal with problems around isolation and so on and deal with things around health, because farmers are often slow, they put everything else in front of their own health. And to me, that's one of the most important things around getting the Irish environment right, is getting farmers' health and safety right. So the department publishes an annual review and outlook every year, and just to the type of people and how much money are farmers making and so on, because sometimes people have an image or they talk about industrial farming and so on. So this is based on the National Farm Survey from 2018 from Chagas. And that's a survey, or it's representative of about 78, 80,000 farmers. And you see things here, this pie chart represents farmers that are viable, sustainable, and vulnerable. So 
to be viable, my understanding is that you make more than 18,000, the average wage, the average agricultural wage. You make more than that, plus a 5% return on non-capital investment. So about a third of farmers are doing that. To be sustainable then means that you have an off-farm income or your partner has an off-farm income. And between that and the farm, you're making enough money to keep going. And then we have a third of the farms that are vulnerable. So a third of the farmers either don't have an off-farm income to go with their farm income or it's not enough. But you can see there that two thirds of agriculture or farmers in Ireland aren't making enough money from farming to be considered viable. So one third is viable from agriculture alone. So when we're talking about making changes on farms in Ireland, and we must, we have to take this into account as well. And it's often these ones that may be vulnerable or in the sustainable category that are perhaps doing a lot or most for habitats and protection. And there's a lot of space or there should be a lot of room to improve habitats in Ireland because the average habitat area, as far as I understand on intensive farms is only about 7%. And we need to get that up above 10. And that can be done by protecting what we have, improving what we have, and then creating more habitats. So it's not like we're asking people to go out and take out productive land from agriculture. We're saying, look, you have a hedgerow there, everybody has landscape features. You have a small area to farm maybe that's not as productive as others. Maybe go a bit easier with the fertilizer on that, graze it a bit later, farmers know where these areas are themselves. Because even late trimming or rotational trimming of hedgerows will make a huge difference to biodiversity. On the right hand side then, you see the type of farmer, or sorry, the age profile of farmers that apply to the Department of Agriculture every year. And the average age is around 55, which is the same across Europe. We have a very small number of young farmers coming in, and we have 10,000 farmers over the age of 80. Now, sometimes people say, look, that's not really real. It's people that hold on to a hectare, or they're, you know, they're setting land, or the land is still in their name, or the herd number is still in their name, and so on. But it is true that we have a disproportionate number of farmers above the age of 65 compared to the average workforce out there. And I think you're about 30 times more likely to be killed on a farm when you're over the age of 65 than in any other area of work in Ireland. So it's something we need to take account of as well. We often don't talk enough about soil. Like we talk about everything, we talk about machinery, we talk about water quality, we talk about climate. But we're looking for soil to filter, we're looking for soil to store, we're looking for soil to grow. So for example, if you look at tillage, if you, there are a number, a huge number, a good number of farmers in Ireland, tillage farmers that are brilliant about soil, practicing minimum tillage, conservation agriculture, where they're looking after soil quality. Also farmers that are using conventional plowing and so on, they're minding soil. But I don't think we're doing enough about it. There has been more research and more of a focus in Chagas Johnstown Castle on it. But often when we think of soil, we just think of soil fertility. We need to think about the quality of the soil. Have we a living soil? Are we treating it right? About a third of the biodiversity on earth is in our soil, underneath our feet. And it's something we very rarely talk about. Just something I could have mentioned earlier, but I didn't. If you looked at those hands and took them as representative of the average Irish farm, only, farmer, only about 20% of the head of households are female. And that's a problem for agriculture as well, because it's been shown across industry that a lack of female involvement stifles innovation and progress. So that needs to change as well. The Department of Agriculture has programs like ACORN that encourage female entrepreneurship, but it is something that the industry needs to take hold of. When you look at the boards of ICOS, the cooperative societies, less than 2% are female. Going back to soil fertility again, it was the case a couple of years ago that only about 14% of soils were at optimum fertility for pH, phosphorus and potassium. Now, if you're an extensive farmer, that's fine. You're not looking to produce a lot of grass or a good deal of grass. You only have a light stocking rate. But we know that we have about a third of the farmers, sorry, 11,500 farmers with about over 20% of the land that have a third of the livestock in the country. And in Ireland, what we're trying to do is grow grass as efficiently and for as long a period as possible. And yet, based on the most recent Chagas soil sample results, we know that only about 20% of the soil is at optimum fertility. So that means that those people are compensating either by using extra nitrogen, which is then lost, or they're feeding meal, which is costing money and which is bad for the environment and which is damaging to our grass-fed image for beef and dairy. So we need to get the pH of the soil right, we need to be applying more lime, we need to get the phosphorus and potassium right. And then when we've done that, or at the same time, we should be looking at the trace elements. Like often you see a difference between the tillage sample and the grassland sample, and I'm not sure why. If you're applying fertilizer on grassland, you should be looking at sulfur and other trace elements as well to get everything working as well as possible. 
animal health has a huge impact on carbon emissions. So if you look something on the right hand column there and look at lameness, you increase CO2 equivalent emissions by almost 10% by having lameness. And lameness is something that should be solved. There should be a program, not just for lameness, but for all disease in animals. It should be something that it's within our grasp. It makes a difference economically to the farmer and it'll make a big difference to the environment. And something that people are talking about more and more, not just in Ireland or across Europe, but worldwide, is animal welfare. So not just that animals are being looked after, but that they're actually content. So that animals aren't walking miles every day to get to the grass and so on, because probably if you have a very large herd, you're using a quad or something else to drive them. And research has shown that there's higher levels, higher levels of lameness and that the dairy animals walking don't have time to pick out where they're going to walk. So animal welfare, not just animal health, but animal welfare also needs to improve. As regards biodiversity in Ireland, agriculture, as I said, makes up two thirds of the land area. And the major impact then is from land use, habitat loss, pollutants from land, so like nitrogen phosphorus coming off, and sediment. And what you see on the right hand side there are, it's a plan that was produced by the National Biodiversity Centre and Water Data, National Biodiversity Data Centre. But what's really interesting here, it's not just talking about farmers, it's talking about everybody making a difference. And that's the same thing with our environment. Everybody needs to change their attitude. So if you go for a walk today in the countryside, you'll see somebody is after throwing litter. Like during the lockdown, people have been very good. They haven't traveled a long way, but there's still litter on country roads. Why is that? Why is food so cheap today? Today, we only spend about 14% of our household income on food. 25 years ago, we used to spend 28% of our income on food. So food has been devalued and people, farmers are trying to produce more and more to make the same or reducing income. And this thing here, this All Ireland Pollinator Plan is an exact, it's an excellent example of people, people coming together to make a difference. And you can make a difference. But the consumer needs to be willing to pay. So new policy that I'll get to later on is going to ask farmers to do more for the environment. But prices of meat or prices of milk in the shop aren't going up. And if you go into a shop today or anybody listening goes into a shop today, would they pay extra for a product that's produced where there's more habitat? Industry needs to row in to support farmers more. We met farmers and policymakers from Holland and they told us Friesland Campina will pay a dairy farmer an extra cent or so per liter of milk if there's more biodiversity area on their farm. Rabobank will give you a cheaper loan at lower interest rate in Holland if you have more biodiversity on your farm. So that's how industry can support farmers and consumer can support farmers to make a difference. But it needs to support it because everybody talks about cap and I'll get to cap in a few minutes. But cap on its own is not enough to cause the change that we need to see. As regards to water quality, which is what we're talking about with the derogation, but everything is going to be considered and is considered, we can see if you look at the orange catchments, this is information from the EPA. So if you look at the map of Ireland on the right hand side, the orange catchments are the catchments where there's high risk of loss from nitrogen uh, from agriculture to water and with a, an impact then on the estuaries that they're draining into. And these losses are increasing. If you look at the bar charts on the left hand side, the blue catchments, you can see that from 2015, they're actually decreasing on those catchments where there isn't a risk from agriculture. Now, 2018, we had a drought, so obviously there's going to be a spike there, you know, because there wasn't dilution in the streams and in the rivers, but the trend is what's worrying. So from 2015, you can see an increasing trend of losses from agriculture or those with at risk of nitrogen losses from agriculture to water. And at the same time, we know since 2015, we've increased the number of dairy cows, and a third of that increase has occurred down in Cork and Tipperary. And of the top 10 counties where there have been increases, most of them are covered by that orange area. It's not something to chastise farmers with, it's just something we need to accept. The average, of nit the average nitrogen use efficiency on farms, I think, is in the mid 20s, so around 24, 25%. And I know you're going to have David Wall and Tim Hyde and Mark Plunkett next week talking about how best to use fertilizer, the best type of fertilizer to use, and probably where and when you should be using it. But we can increase nitrogen and phosphorus use efficiency. And we need to do it quickly. Because if you think about it, for every 100 kilos of, of nitrogen, or every four bags of can, say, if we take 100 units of nitrogen, four bags of can, and apply it to land, we're going to lose about 75 of those on average to the environment. And that needs to change. And there are simple ways and simple methods that farmers can do, things that they can do to change it. 
The most obvious one is only applying fertilizer when there's going to be growth. That's really important. Every year when we have the closed period, which is when you can't spread slurry, we hear about how stupid calendar farming is. But the Chagask Agricultural Catchments Programme has shown that there's twice as much loss of nutrients during the closed period as any other time of year. And yet 15 years later, we're still hearing this every year about the closed period. It seems to be we have a problem with slurry storage. We don't have enough. So then the way to get around that is say, right, this closed period during the winter is stupid. I should be let dump my slurry because that's what you're doing. You're not getting value from it that you get in springtime. I'll dump it in the winter and hope I'm not caught. But not being caught is not enough because what you're doing if you do that is ruining it for everybody else. It's the tragedy of the commons. So what you're doing is giving farmers a bad name. Those people are farmers that are spreading during the close period or spreading when it's raining or they spread in July and a big storm comes and the slurry is lost because they, I don't know why, or they don't get it out till October. They're ruining it for everybody else because they're having a disproportionate impact on the environment. By spreading slurry at that time of year, you're doing major harm. So the action program that came in originally in 20, 2005, like we have nitrogen and phosphorus legal limits, buffer zones, you must soil sample if you're a derogation farmer, and a green cover if you remove, so if you spray off with Roundup or a non-selective herbicide after the harvest, you have to get a green cover back in place. One issue that's going to be a major focus in the next review, which we've started now, is this idea of manure storage. So since 2015, we've seen a change in the structure of farms. So we have the Large farmers, 11,500, with a stocking rate above 170. There are nearly 2,000 farmers stocked above 250. About a half or two thirds of the milk in Ireland, I think, is produced on derogation farms. Is it right to treat these farmers the same as a farmer with 85 or 100 kilo stocking rate? So a fella or woman at two or three livestock units per hectare, should they be treated the same at, as one livestock unit per hectare? Blanket regulations have brought us so far, but in the future, we'll have to have targeted measures. So the idea that there'll have to be more storage on farms will have to be explored because we've had about three times in the last six years or seven years calls for an extended close period or, or to be allowed to spread in the, um, in the close period. This idea of two cows making up the 170 kilos. The latest Chagas model shows that the stocking, or sorry, that cow is actually excreting 89 kilos per hectare, or sorry, each cow is excreting 89 kilos not 85 kilos, 89 kilos. So if I was getting a loan today to expand, the bank will stress, che stress check me on the basis of a higher interest rate. If you're a farmer, a dairy farmer out there, for 2021, you should be looking at your system and saying, can I cope with reduced fertilizer use, reduced nitrogen, and can I cope if the dairy cow changes to 89 kilos? Because that's what's coming very shortly. It is going to change from 85 to 89. The amount of nitrogen and the amount of fertilizer used on farms will have to reduce. So what are you doing this year to get ready for next year? Because it is going to change. And it'll save you money. Reducing fertilizer will save you money. But are you putting out lime this year? The amount of lime being spread is only about half of what was being spread in the 80s. And sometimes people say we should subsidize the use of lime. Why should we subsidize a factor or something that's there that's going to produce more grass to make you more money and reduce your impact on the environment. It doesn't seem to make sense. There are other things out there that can and should be supported like habitats and so on, but the use of lime is something that farmers should be doing to get the best from their land, to improve their soil function, and to get nitrogen and phosphorus working as well as they can. In 2019, there was a derogation review and compulsory use of lime was introduced for derogation farmers. So from this year on, if you're in the derogation, you must use lime. You must use low emission equipment. And from next year, we'll be saying, hopefully, we'll reduce the amount of chemical nitrogen on your farm because you're using low emission equipment. And people say, look, I'll use the splash plate in January, February, March, April, and I'll use the low emission equipment later on. But that's not good enough. There was one day this year where it was 18 and a half degrees in April, and someone down close to me was spreading slurry. They were doing the right thing. They were getting slurry out in springtime. But Irish weather is very variable. We could get a day in July where it's not 18 and a half degrees. 18 and a half degrees in April, you get huge losses of ammonia. So low emission equipment is mandatory on derogation farms. For these people that are exporting slurry, in the near future, they will have to use low emission equipment as well. The program in the, the, the program, or sorry, the photo in the center is the most important photo there because what it involves or what it's trying to represent is training. So we're going to have more training for farmers, 
we will be talking more to advisors and researchers about training, the training that's needed for advisors and advisors have freely open to it that they need more training because since CAP came in, a lot of advisors' time is taken up filling forms rather than giving technical advice. So we have to improve on that front and we know there's a big focus in the next CAP on improving the knowledge base so that farmers are getting one message. One thing you see during the current crisis is that there's one clear message and we don't have that at the moment in agriculture. Some advisors focus on farms, some focus on technical advice, some focus on expanding. And where is the environment of that or is there time for the environment at all? We need to look at the education that farmers are receiving. We need to look at the education that agricultural science graduates are receiving. Does it talk enough about working in harmony with the environment? Are we talking enough about soil, biodiversity, water quality, climate? That there's a good understanding there that people are clear on what they're being asked to do. If you're a derogation farmer and you're receding, you must include clover. There's potential to save between 80 and 100 kilos of nitrogen per hectare by using clover. And you must measure grass or participate in a, in a group to learn how to measure grass because we know that average production in Ireland, seven, eight tons of grass per hectare. Some of the best farmers are producing up 12, 14 tons. So that's where we need to get to. We want to improve this, we're claiming, we're saying all the time it's our major asset, we want to get the best use possible from it. You also must undertake a biodiversity measure if you're a derogation farm, which won't impact hugely on your, on your, on your business. It, things like um, rotational cutting of hedgerows or letting a white thorn scot grow every couple of hundred meters. What it does, you're going to be more aware, aware of it. You have to get the crude protein down below 16% unless an advisor says you need it higher. And the reason for this, feed or animal feed in Ireland, meal, concentrates, it's a small proportion of the diet, but it's something we can control quite readily. So we need to bring it down to where the animal needs it. And very often we have high protein levels in grass. Definitely grass breeding over time should be looking at lower crude protein because it's the, it's the major feed. But what we can do at the minute is reduce it. So it's a waste for the animal anyway. If you're giving high levels of crude protein and the animal is excreting it, it's actually stressing it out to get rid of it. And it comes out in the urine at a rate of about 1,000 kilos per hectare. So it is something that we want people to look at and want people to think about and we want people to comply with. So, so far what we're seeing agriculture and the environment Animal numbers have increased. People will say they're only back to where they were 30 years ago, and that's right. They're still increasing slightly. But what we have seen is intensification in certain areas. Fertilizer sales and trends in 2018, they had been static almost for 20, 25 years. 2018, they went up 10%. Last year, they went down about 10%. And we'll see what happens this year. Hopefully, they'll stabilize. Greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture are up. Ammonia emissions from slurry spreading and use of fertilizer are up. 99.9%, .9%, I think, of ammonia emissions in Ireland are coming from agriculture. And we can reduce those by using protected urea, which you're going to be talking about next week, and by using low emission equipment. Biodiversity, when, 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 they're check, when checks are done on habitats around Ireland on protected areas, biodiversity in Ireland is in decline. Water quality is in decline. What are we doing as regards soil health? And an item there that we don't often think about is social license. So if you're saying that, I can't produce and meet these environmental restrictions. What are we meant to do about it? The state can't afford to subsidize people to bring them back um, compliant with environmental legislation. So who's going to pay for it? It's not all going to come from CAP. It's not going to come from state. Industry needs to be involved. Consumer needs to be involved. Farmers must support it and buy into it. We need everybody that's talking to farmers, whether they're from the bank or from the co-ops or agricultural advisors. We have some fantastic agricultural advisors, whether they're in Chagask or private or working in the local co-op behind the desk. They perform a very important function. But what message are they giving to farmers? And do they truly believe that we need to change practice to improve our environment? Because until we do that, and until we're all giving the one message and working together, it's going to be very hard to cause change. The other thing that's not going to, or is not, I believe is not going to cause change, is a vilification of agriculture. We need to acknowledge from both sides, even if there are sides anymore, we need to improve our environment. It's the overriding concern. Farmers have done a lot of good. Often you get you hear criticism of schemes in Ireland and so on, but where would we be without the schemes? So definitely there's a need to improve and a will to improve, but acknowledge the good that has been done, acknowledge the progress that has been made, and try and work together for a better future. And then hopefully we'll make progress. The policy proposals in the future are going to be shaped around the European Green Deal that everybody's heard of. 
Like I know CAP is being reformed at the moment and by 2023, for the next few years, we're going to have transitional regulations probably. And I'm not sure what's going to be there, what measures will be there. They're being discussed at the moment, but nothing is agreed. The budget isn't agreed. We know that there's huge pressure on the CAP budget from Brexit, now from the crisis that we have through the coronavirus. But the farm to fork is the agricultural part of the European Green Deal. And that's aiming to change the way we farm in Europe. The, bio, the draft biodiversity strategy was released at the start of this week. And that's talking about a 50% reduction in loss of nutrients from agriculture to the environment, a 20% reduction in nitrogen fertilizer, an increase of up to 10% of utilizable agricultural area being protected or being habitats being created on it and improved upon it. These are major changes. So what are you doing as a farmer or as an advisor to think about this? Like we can stick our heads in the sand and say, look, that's not going to work here. Or we can look at the ways that we can improve nitrogen use efficiency. Can we get more from less? Like it's impossible to keep going back and squeezing. So money has to come in here from somewhere. The cap is a reduced budget. How are farmers going to change? Because there has to be a change. There has to be a change. There is, we cannot continue with unbridled expansion and think that we're not having a serious detrimental impact on the environment. We need to acknowledge and support those farmers that are protecting the environment. But that money is going to have to come in from a number of sources. Over the next couple of months, farm to fork and what's going to happen and the time scale within it will become clearer. In Ireland at the moment, we're reviewing the river. The Department of Housing are responsible for water quality legislation and the, the um, River Basin Management Plan, which is the implementation of the Water Framework Directive, is being reviewed. And that's also looking at agriculture and looking at the figures from the EPA that I showed you earlier and saying, look, what's happening here? Like, we've been working together for a good number of years. There's a very good relationship between the EPA, the Advisory Service, Department of Housing, other government departments, and agriculture. We're working together, and yet the environment isn't improving. What's wrong? Do we need more regulation? Do we need to look at housing? So we need industry to buy in. We need the farm organizations to buy in to support it, so that the message to farmers is clear. We're going to work to resolve this together. So just in conclusion, if you don't remember anything else from today, reduce the amount of nitrogen on your farm. See, can you save a couple of units on every round? If you're applying nitrogen in springtime, are you getting growth from it? Is it just because the neighbor is doing it or because you're reading it in the paper? Only apply nitrogen where and when it's going to be effective and you get most value from it. Collaboration is key across our whole sector. I'm part of the sector, so are you. If you're here today, you're part of the sector. We need to work together and to bring in more and increase the level of understanding that we all have of each aspect of finance, of the habitats, of the welfare of animals and so on. We need to collaborate. And finally, I'd ask you all to stay healthy. Particularly at this time, it's the most important thing. It's what I identified from the EPA slide. Farmers need to be encouraged to stay healthy and to look after themselves. Thank you very much, Mark. That's me. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, really thought-provoking presentation there. And might I add uh, a lot of common sense uh, included as well. Um, well done and thanks for that. Uh, Jack, we're getting lots and lots of questions here about your thought-provoking presentation. Um, uh, just to kick things off here, we, we have uh, a question here asking about you know, the benefits of hedgerows and the importance of allowing them to grow and develop properly. Will the next cap stop penalizing farmers for doing this and instead reward us for its carbon sequestration and biodiversity? Uh, and I imagine that extends to these uh, ineligible areas as well, where there seems to be uh, some contradictions there in the policy. And, and maybe, you look, that's, that's a, sometimes a general issue with CAT, that we do see these contradictions throughout and, and sometimes lose sight of, of the main principles and objectives uh, when we get down to the nitty gritty of the, the legislation. Yeah, there's a real problem there between Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 at the moment, where Pillar one, which is direct payments, says you must have the land clean. Now it does make allowances. And if you look at the basic payment scheme terms and conditions, it'll show you that um, things have changed. You know, it should be clear to farmers that not every area needs to be cleaned off with a high Mac. But definitely there's a fear there that areas that we're trying to support in pillar two aren't supported in pillar one. So people often bring up the area of eligibility. So I get an inspection today. I'm, I'm, I'm told that the overgrown area in the corner, that's ineligible and going to be penalized. 
our own minister, the Minister for Agriculture, brought that up at the Council of Ministers last June and said in the next cap, we have to do something about eligibility. In the current cap, what we've done, there's no problem with not cutting your hedgerows on a rotational basis. There's no problem with only topping a hedgerow. So I wouldn't agree that we're forcing people to make the box-shaped hedges that you see in some parts of the country. There is room for hedgerows there, but definitely more needs to be done around eligibility. And hopefully it will be done in the future. This year, it came up with the Agricultural Sustainability Support and Advisory Programme, which is a joint programme between housing, agriculture, chagask and industry, where we have water advisors, free advisors on the ground supporting farmers, that if areas of the farm are identified, and these are set aside or margins let grow bigger, specifically for the purpose of water quality, well, then they will remain eligible. And that's where we know we need to go more in the future. But even recently, an article on the paper clarifying that you don't have to spray rushes every year to keep the land eligible. Once there's evidence of agricultural activity, that's okay. Because we have a real problem with MCPA in water. And the more testing that we do, or that the EPA do, the more problems we find with pesticides. And you see these notices and the public are starting to wonder what's wrong. But I agree with the person that asked the question, we need to do more about it. However, straight away this year, don't cut your hedges. Leave it till next January, February. You don't have to be out cutting your ditches as soon as the open period starts on the 1st of September. And you won't be penalised for that. Sure, I know. Uh, and, and look, we've been working with the agricultural contractors with, uh, on areas like that. And I agree with, with you wholeheartedly that we need a whole system approach to this. Um, just a question for you, Jack. I mean, is there, based on your, your points about the opportunities for collaboration, do, is there a need for greater collaboration at a, at a national level? I mean, is there scope there for some, uh, you know, working group with, with, with all of the interested parties to, to really focus on these issues? I know there are, there are some, some uh, groups there. Yeah, there are a lot of groups there. For example, there's a CAP consultative committee at the minute that's made up of farm organisations, environmental NGOs, Chagas, private advisory, industry and so on. For the food-wise implementation, there's a high-level implementation committee that has involvement of the EPA and so on. I suppose I think it's going to take a whole of government approach. We have a very strong relationship with the Department of Housing, the EPA, yourselves, private advisors, and industry. And that needs to be fostered and developed for further. I'd say ASAP is the start of it. Mm. But we need to look at ASAP and see, right, what's been achieved here? Has it achieved anything? And yes, it has, and hopefully the results will prove that. But then it needs more support. Mm -hmm and financial support, not just lip service saying we think it's a great idea. And where is that money going to come from? We also need the consumer to row in. If we walked up the road, sorry, you can't. If I walked up the road to the shop here, I'd pay more for water than I'd pay for milk. You know, what's happening there? Like why price of milk so low? Price of beef to a farmer, I don't know, is it 340, 350 a kilo today? Does the average consumer know the price of beef? Do they know how much we're importing from a horticultural side? Why don't we have more potatoes grown in Ireland? Why are our vegetables flying halfway around the world? Why do we have food all year round out of season? Like we export an awful lot, so I'm all for free trade, but we don't seem to know what grows at what time of year anymore. And then we should put a value on it. Because I went into a health food shop in Wexford there, and I saw a litre of soya, and I don't know if they had milk or not under it. It's been clarified that you shouldn't call something milk unless it comes from an animal, as far as I understand. Yeah. But it was about three times the price of milk from a cow. And what's the, where is that coming from? Where is that coming from? Yeah. You know, so there's a lot we need to think about and talk about and increase the level of understanding in all sectors of society. Okay, Jack, we're, we're going to have to uh, provide uh, abbreviated answers because we have so many questions coming right. through here. So, Pat, I'm going to hand over to you uh, to, to fire a few uh, questions there from our listeners to... to, uh, to Jack. Okay, I'll give you, give you a couple. There's, as I say, a lot of questions coming in. One, um, our latest EPA report showed deterioration in water quality. How will this affect uh, our review of the nitrates action plan in the next year? Uh, nitrogen is going to have to reduce. Chemical fertilizer rates are going to have to reduce. So take action on your now to reduce nitrogen. The 85 kilos is going to go up to 89 kilos. We'll be reviewing the density of stocking rates. So when I was growing up a zero grazer, you'd stop to look at it on the road. Now there seems to be more people using zero grazers, and it's not the zero grazer in particular, but it's the system. Have we a very high stocking rate on the grazing platform? That'll be looked at. Slurry storage will have to be looked at. Okay. 
These are all the things. Uh, on a completely different tack, there's a few questions around, I suppose, both ends of how do you uh, encourage participation of, of the younger population and uh, I suppose at the other side, uh, mention of the fact that we had a, a farm retirement scheme in the past to, to, recur to encourage uh, uh, transition and, and succession. Is there any possibility of a return or something in that space to try and, and encourage that, that uh, uh, succession process? Uh, there's a real problem with getting young farmers in. And it's great when you see young farmers. I was up in UCD with the ASA Agricultural Science Association earlier on in the year, and it was brilliant to see the interest and just the enthusiasm of the graduates there, you know, and they were excellent, and that's fantastic. So the industry has a strong future. As regards the um, bringing in an early retirement scheme, Commissioner Hogan was already clear there wouldn't be. And it's a shame, the, the previous early retirement scheme said you had to stop farming altogether, and that was uh, extremely problematic. Like when you look at the age profile, and there's a lot of experience there to be lost. So it's not going to come through CAP, but is there something there that, say, co-ops could do? Could co-ops encourage, you know, farmers to come on? Because currently it's done through, say, tax laws. So it's very attractive to lease land, for example. But it's not going to come through CAP. So I'd look out to industry and see what can industry do about it. Sorry, just one point to make earlier on. When you said policy, Mark, when you said do we need a national group, we need to line up and have a coherent policy, whether that's in tax, environment, or wherever. Mm -hmm. So the whole government's approach does need to be aligned, sort of given one clear message. Okay. A couple of other questions around the change from, from 89 to, to uh, or sorry, from 85 to 89. 89 yeah. uh, one was, is that going to come into place next year, or what's the timeline on that? And the second one was, uh, is there going to be an equivalent uh, 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 increase in all other categories of livestock as well? What, the, so the 85 kilos is based on where you're looking at the nitrogen in, nitrogen out, and average milk produced. And over the past 20 years, average milk production has increased in Ireland per cow. So. It's not a one kilo in, one kilo out, but there isn't that efficiency in the middle. So the more you produce, the more you're actually losing. So whether it'll be in next year or not, I'm not 100% certain. If I was a farmer sitting here today watching this, I'd be planning for next year that it will be in because who knows what's going to happen. I, I can't genuinely can't give you 100%, but you should be planning on the basis that it would be in and change your operation or make plans for it. On other livestock, we're told there hasn't been such significant changes, but they will be part of the review as well. So we'll be looking at everything because we do know there are issues there around things like poultry manure, for example, where the level of nitrogen in it needs to be reviewed. And it probably will be increased because there's no, more nitrogen in broiler manure than the regulation says. So all aspects of the regulation will be reviewed. All the technical tables in the regulation will be reviewed. So for example, rainfall. Rainfall has increased and will increase in the future according to all the models. So if you have an open yard or an open tank, after the next regulation, which is going to come in place in 2021, you will have to take account of more rainfall than previously. We'll be looking at the nitrogen rates across everything and it'll all be based on research path. So if the research is there saying there needs to be a change, well then it'll be changed. But definitely the 85 to 89 is coming down the tracks. Jack, just for, you know, for farmers who are considering doing building now, um, are they going to be subject to those regulations, uh, you know, if they've finished their, their projects next year or early or at the end of this year, uh, will they be subject to those new regulations then? Or should they be planning now for those, that scenario of potentially extended uh, uh, housing periods? I remember reading in the paper, Mark, and I'll answer your question in a minute. A man up in Westmead used to write in a paper and he was saying that uh, they had a six month winter nearly, a five to six month winter. And the close period up there isn't six months. So people think like close period here in Mexico is 16 weeks and I need 12 weeks storage. Nobody should think they can get away with 12 weeks. What they should say is, look, this is the minimum required in the regulation. However, there are years there where I might not get out in January and I don't want to be ringing a contractor with an umbilical system to spread it because I know he's not going to track the land and he can travel where I won't travel with a tanker. So what you should do is look at the legal minimum and then look around you and say, well, this is what's happening here. And you'll be granted to get that slurry stored. Thanks, Jack. Uh, Jack, just, uh, I, I suppose, uh, uh, a couple of tricky questions in here, and I'll go to, to, to give them to you. Uh, what does, uh, three in one, 
Uh, will the department conduct an audit uh, stroke inspections of exporting farm, recipient farms uh, that submitted farms uh, for slurry export over the past number of months? That's the first part of a question. Uh, you stated the numbers of farmers seeking derogation are, are down. Uh, will that from inspect farms or farms that were previously sought derogation but have opted out this year? And the final part of it is a 1% penalty on farms uh, direct payment, enough sanction uh, for those in breach of regulation. Some tough, tough questions there. Yeah, that's a good one. <coughs> a good one. So the department does 12 to 1500 inspections for local authorities every year. And yeah, they'll be in the risk criteria. So if you're at a high stocking rate and you're exporting slurry, maybe you're 100%, and who's to say you're not? But if you're exporting slurry to come down to the 170 limit, you're only meant to be using six bags of cancer. Whereas where you're in the derogation, you can use eight, seven and a half or eight, depending on your stocking rate. So how are you growing the grass to feed these animals at the high stocking rate? Maybe you're super efficient and you're doing it. These will be included. They definitely will be included. And in the future, there will be more requirements of these highly stocked farmers that don't avail of the derogation. The other part of this is, if you're a pig farmer or a poultry farmer, you're subject to IPPC license. And not many, but there are some very intensive farms in Ireland that have gone over, like we think of the average farm now, maybe 100 cows would be an average farmer. You know, it's grown significantly, or is it 80? I don't know, but definitely 100 cows is common. But say if you have three, four or 500 cows, are you an average farmer? And should you be treated the same as somebody with 100 cows or should you have different requirements? That's something we're going to look at as well. And I'm sorry, Pat, I can't remember the third question. Well, the third was on in relation to penalties. That is the one percent of your direct payment enough of a penalty. That depends on who you are and how dependent you are on it. Like if you're a young farmer and you're trying to expand, one percent could mean an awful lot to you. But you see, if we talk about penalties, we're not going to change behaviour. If I go out for a walk this evening with my children, I'll put on a high vis jacket because it's part of the culture now. We've had behaviour change, and we need behaviour change here. Penalties are only part of the solution, but they're not all the solution. Because what we'll do if we increase the penalties and keep hitting at farmers. So why not sell the entitlements and then have no risk of penalties at all? What we want in the department is that it becomes socially unacceptable to be polluting or damaging the environment intentionally. And I think there are very few farmers that are doing that, but we want the culture to change and regulation is only a part of that. So we need to support farmers and change, work with them, and then the ones that are blatantly causing problems, definitely penalties should be there. But that's only part of the solution. Jack, from the, the last number of uh, webinars that we've had, we've heard l largely about the, the greenhouse gas emissions, ammonia emissions. Uh, we'll, we'll be later hearing about biodiversity. There are so many challenges uh, facing farmers, and I suppose the concern is that you have all of these different strands uh, uh, focusing on the, the pinhead of a farm, uh, and uh, farmers you know understandably are you know some are becoming overwhelmed with all of these various different uh, asks of them um and it was a conference there we had last year and one of the participants you know that they, they talked about this and they said look is there an opportunity for greater uh, support from the wider industry to help farmers to comply with all of these different uh, regulations Do you have any thoughts on that jack yeah i think it's a really good point I think it's a really good point. Like if I was going up to a pitch now to mark a fella, say I was corner back or full back, I'm giving clear instructions. And they don't tell me what the corner forward is going to do. There's an awful lot coming in at farmers. But the simplest way to look at this is, look, I have a lovely environment. We're in a good place. Like if we went over to Holland today, that ten, I said earlier on the biodiversity strategy is going to look for 10% of an area, UAA to go towards biodiversity. Go to Holland and there's nothing there or very little there. Look around you here, look out the window after this. We're starting from a good place. From a farmer's point of view, what you need to think of, every time you put on a spinner or buy fertilizer or ring a contractor hopefully to do it, because normally it's been done very accurately with a contractor with a GPS system, that I'm getting the most value for money. I'm only putting it out when the crop is growing. I'm only going to put it where it's needed and I'm going to put out the right amounts on fertile soil. If you just did that, everything else will flourish. We'll have a huge impact on the environment by just doing that. The other thing is ask whoever you get with the hedge cutter, or if you own one yourself, lift it a foot. Keep out a foot, just a foot, a foot and a half. Give it a chance. You don't have to prove that you're a perfect, clean, spotless person by destroying hedgerows and making them into grassy banks. It's a shame to see it. Like when you go picking blackberries, if you go picking blackberries, you'll see if you have a grassy bank, there's no blackberries. We have room for a few blackberries to grow. We don't have to take on, you don't have to understand everything. My own head gets fried with all the stuff going on. 
Mm. Start with simple things, make a few small changes, look around the yard, are there a couple of things I can do? Are all the shoots on the shed working? Or is the water flowing into a tank? Which means I've more to store, more slurry to spread. Mm. There are a few little changes I can make. When you see all the bags being made, the round bales of silage being made, are they being made because they're being needed? Or because we're putting out so much nitrogen that we're getting excess growth that now we have to bale. Now, what is the plan here? Can we look at the nitrogen? Like you hear people have problem with nitrogen, nitrates in the silage. Like should we be cutting back a little bit? If you have poor quality silage this year or last year, have you planned for this year about how you're going to make it better? Because even by doing that, you're changing your business, you're saving money, you're protecting the environment because you're going to buy less meal next winter because you have better quality silage. So improve your farming practice. Improve your farming practices, you'll benefit the environment. Take small steps, but we need to keep improving. You can never stay static. We need to keep improving, no matter what walk of life you're in. We have to keep improving and adapting, climate change, environment, and so on, and farming is just the same. Okay, Jack, just a couple of questions. One, uh, one common theme to coming through actually is great presentation. Uh, we've, we've seen that a, a lot in the, in the comments coming through. But, Thank you. Uh, one uh, question there, you briefly mentioned greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, do you see it posing similar uh, challenges in the future as nitrates or I suppose do we need to integrate our, our policy in relation to both uh, greenhouse gases and water quality? We're working on integrating our policy path. Water will be, you see, because we have to review the nitrates every four years, water is more immediate and biodiversity. But climate is there for a long time. We need to start making changes today to protect the climate. But the changes we make to protect or to change greenhouse gases will impact on water quality and biodiversity and ammonia. Get the soil fertility right. Protect the habitats. You know, work on the hedgerows. And hopefully then in the future, we will be paying people for storing carbon in these hedgerows, like the farm in Devonish have done. So they've analysed it and said, right, there's carbon here, we're carbon neutral. Wouldn't that be a great marketing tool if we could have certain farmers that are carbon neutral get an extra money for their milk, get an extra money for their beef, get an extra money for their lamb? Because that's where we want to get to ultimately. Another question, Jack. Uh, when it comes to, to water quality derogation farms, you've I focused a lot on them. But uh, I suppose this is a comment. A lot, uh, we need to do a lot in relation to a lot of the, the contribution uh, of uh, smaller, less efficient farmers, particularly in phosphorus sensitive areas. Yeah, definitely. We need to get soil fertility right. And sorry, when I was mentioning beef, sheep, beef, sorry, lamb and milk, there's also uh, tillage out there. Tillage plays a really important role, you know, that we have to think of as well around protecting the soil. We have some excellent farmers. What's the future for them here in Ireland? Like a couple of weeks ago, lads got a text saying, your malt and barley price or your contract is going to be cut now because we don't need it. We're always telling them to get into a premium market. But can we pay farmers extra? For doing more for the environment is there a market there for that i agree this is not just those farmers that are intensive this is all farmers every farmer has an impact and every farmer can make a change on the farm that will improve and protect the environment and that comes through an increased level of understanding and a social acceptability that it's the right thing to do it's it has to be seen as the right thing to do so if i see a slurry tanker on the road in november i'm thinking that's wrong that's not the right thing to do there used to be an awful lot of people doing backyard burning you know for plastic and rid of rubbish and all it's very seldom now because it's unacceptable and we need to be the same that just needs to grow out that every farmer is thinking this is the right thing to do and they're doing it not because they think someone like me is going to come along and do an inspection but because they understand this is the right thing to do jack i suppose we don't have much time left but there, there's a there's a a theme of questions around advice, um, uh, uh, questions about why do we need more one-on-one -on -one advice with farmers, questions about the, the training of farmers and, and, and who's going to do it. Is it just Chagas or is uh, there scope and, and uh, uh, um, I suppose a place for, for other advisors uh, uh, dealing with farmers? You might just comment on that. There's scope for everybody in the industry to share knowledge. There was a survey a couple of years ago that showed that the people that farmers pay most attention to obviously are their family and then the agricultural advisors. And way down at the bottom comes regulators like me. So definitely there's a role for advisors, a huge role for advisors. The training is not going to 
fully from the department because to be honest i don't have the knowledge or others probably you know that we have brilliant experts but we have to look outwards we have to bring it in we have to engage with people in the epa with people in npws with experts in trinity like look at trinity last week putting in uh, they're going to have a wildflower meadow on the front lawns of trinity for the future which is brilliant isn't it and a message that's going to send out so we have to engage with experts across the city and bring them in to talk with farmers and that's what's really important these are not knowledge transfer sessions you're sharing knowledge with farmers and farmers are sharing knowledge with you because if i walk onto a farm today the farmer knows a lot more about that land than me or you and we have to acknowledge that take it into account and then agree with that farmer what are the right solutions on that farm that are going to make a difference Jack, uh, I know a number of years ago there were discussions about the location of der derogation farms, uh, particularly in more sensitive areas. Uh, do you foresee that that is going to be a factor in your discussions around the next review? Yeah, definitely. Last year we were asked by um, DG Environment, um, so DG is the same as department here, Director General Environment, and what impact is the derogation having on habitats in Ireland? Should we be doing an appropriate assessment? Like if I wanted to put up a plant here or a cement plant or something or smaller industry and I'm going to have an impact on the environment, I have to do what's called an appropriate assessment under the Habitats Directive, I think it's Article 6. And people are saying to us, well, did you do that for the derogation? And yes, we did, we did an environmental assessment. We'll have to do another one next year. You know, it'll be ongoing. And that'll have to assess, look, if you're going to lose 75% of the nitrogen that you're going to apply and you're going to damage the water quality and reduce it, and you're not going to make changes. Like, is that acceptable? So definitely appropriate assessment of the derogation is something that's important and will be done. And uh, Jack, just a, a couple of final questions there around, you know, um, uh, slurry spreading, ban, um, splash plate. Are we going to see a, a date for the end of splash plate for everyone? Is that, is that coming? Well, what'll, what'll be done, Mark, is that it'll be assumed that you're using low emission equipment. So you can work away with the splash plate if you're on a certain farm, perhaps, but your chemical allowance will be reduced. So, and just that's really important around the allowance because I worked as a farm advisor and I've worked, you know, as a rep, different things. And we all know, like, when I'm preparing the dockets to submit to the department, that we can submit the dockets that will show that I'm compliant. Like I said, nitrogen and fertilizer use is the same for 25 years, but it's definitely not the same all over the country. So... Are there some farmers that are using more fertilizer than they're legally allowed to use? And if they are, well, then we need a fertilizer use in Ireland. That'll show who's compliant and who's not. Because at the minute, if, you were, if all the farmers in Ireland were compliant with the fertilizer limits, we shouldn't be having the problems that we're having. Like I think as the stocking rate has increased in certain parts of the country, it's obvious grass growth is needed there, more grass, more fertilizer is applied. And perhaps, or definitely not as efficiently as we need. So there is a whole area around nitrogen that will have to be corrected. Jack, there's a, a comment, and I'll, I'll name a person this time. It's uh, Donald Sheen has made a comment that there is a, a need for uh, farms to be visited by ecologists to, to, to put a bit of balance on it. And maybe just make a, a, a comment on that. Uh, Donald and his group down in, in the Bride have just uh, brought out a guide to, I'm not sure of the, the exact title of it, uh, to uh, biodiversity on the farm. I think anybody who's here should actually go onto the Bride website and pull it down because it's a superb, absolutely superb uh, uh, document and, and congratulations to, to them on that. Uh, but I think it also points a little bit to, to the policy of the EIP program and, and some really strong output coming from, uh, from that. Uh, and hopefully that will that kind of inventiveness can continue in in the cap in the future already yeah i do would like to congratulate donald on what's been done in the bride i think it's excellent and I acknowledge the colleagues in the department in johnstown that run the eips you know they're very good programs they're bottom up so farmers are involved i think there's a lot of good things happening there that we can all learn from uh, we had a an audit from the uh, european court of auditors last july and a colleague in Johnstown Castle brought them around the country and they said the same point to us. Like, they didn't say we need more ecologists, they said we need more understanding of ecology. So whether the degree needs to change or people need to do, advisors need to do specific training in ecology, I agree 100% with what Donald is saying. We need to broaden our skill set, and by we I mean the industry, so that we understand biodiversity better. So that we don't just talk about bags of fertilizer and whether I should use protected urea or urea, but we talk about the impact on the environment. 
the impact on biodiversity. Every farmer likes to see birds, bees. I was up the road the other day. One thing that's not in it is that you can hear wildlife much more. You can hear the insects, you can hear the birds. And I think people appreciate that. So whether we need more ecologists or not, but we definitely need a greater understanding of it. And what I would like to see, and there is part of the ag degree in one of the colleges that does cover ecology a bit more, the ag degree and the green cert and all training going to advisors, farmers, people in banks, include biodiversity. I 100% support that. Okay, Jack, thank you very much for that. We're going to have to leave it at that. We'd love to to talk for, for much longer and maybe we'll get you back again for a, a future discussion. Um, a Could I say one thing? Of course I, I forgot to say, you. Wexford, when Pat said it, it's a lovely place. I should have said, we're the reigning Leinster hurling champions. <laughs> and that'll continue probably next year. <laughs> Very good. A proud Wexford man. Another proud Wexford man. Well well done to that, to, to you and that, Jack. And, and uh, I suppose to summarise, I mean, nitrogen, we need to look at... Uh, our advice around that, um, the opportunities for collaboration, and of course, uh, farmer health as well uh, being paramount. And if we can't get that right, how, how can we focus on, on the others? Uh, it's like the, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs almost uh, that we, we need to go through. Uh, my thanks to, to Pat Murphy and to Yvonne Marr and Andy Boland, who are doing Trojan work in the background in terms of organizing uh, these events. and. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm only, uh, and Pat, are, we're, we're two of uh, a, a larger team, and we must give credit to uh, the, the team and, and also our partners who are involved in the, uh, the delivery of, of these events. Um, you can uh, see the recording of today's uh, uh, webinar, and also the presentation will be available on the Chagas website. Uh, we do hope to have that available on later on today. Uh, and also, we would ask if you could uh, take the time to fill out our survey, uh, looking for your feedback and ideas on future webinars. So with that... Mark, uh, could I just make a, 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 a course, very yeah. quick point? Uh, based on, on some of the feedback that we've got, there was a lot of questions. We, we originally started this series looking uh, fairly much specifically at, at uh, greenhouse gas and, and gaseous emissions. Uh, there was a lot of feedback, a lot of positive feedback, but a lot of feedback asking us to broaden out our horizons a little bit into the uh, cover the other issues. So, in fact, what we have done is we have done that, and we well we initially intended to just go through till till uh, June, early July. We're we're broadening out with inclusion of water quality and some biodiversity issues uh, in the, the the schedule and pushing the, the length of the series right out to, to be ongoing if you, if, if you want. So we will be bringing out next month's um, uh, schedule and there will be quite a bit of water quality issues dealt with in that. So thanks for the feedback. It's been really encouraging and uh, people seem to, to like what they're, they're uh, being exposed or, or getting a chance to hear. Great. Thanks again. Okay, thanks, Pat. And sure, with that, we will wish you all a good weekend and look forward to you uh, joining us next week. Uh, we'll be joined by Mark Plunkett, Tim Hyde, and Dr. David Wall from Chagas, who will be speaking about uh, nitrogen use efficiency, uh, largely looking at uh, the low emissions slurry uh, and making the best use of slurry. So thank you very much again.